you look, you hit Charles and Watford, Charles and Watford. You turn around the motorway and hit him south with the heavy, heavy eyes and the dry dirt mouth. So it's Charles and Watford, Charles and Watford. Motorway's coming like a video game at a hundred miles an hour. The old truck groans and the wheels complain, but I can't go any slow. I have such a passion for the river. I think the best thing that's happened to me really is the quality of my life here is so wonderful. I have such fun, I have wonderful friends. I love the river itself, it's so beautiful and I could go on forever. The great joy of living on a boat is being able to, is being able to move about, being able to wake up in different places with different noises um, and to take your house with you, to, to go on holiday and have forgotten nothing. They just watch the river and it's beautiful. You just sit and look at the river and you forget everything. It's just like a never-ending holiday. <laughs> well, as you probably guessed by now, this week south of Watford takes to the water. Now, the nearest most of us get to a life afloat is a Sunday afternoon drink down by the river or thrown up over the side of a disco boat. But for a growing number of people, the river, or indeed the canal, is a way of life. They live on it. Now, you may ask yourself, with all this, uh, nasty wet water lying around why anyone should do it well stick around because tonight we're going to be exploring the darkest backwaters of london town and we're going to track down the boat dwellers in their peculiar habitat it's going to be quite a voyage of discovery because as you're going to find out soon london's got a lot more water in it than you'd think there's the thames which as you may have noticed runs through london plus the various bits of the Grand Union Canal, which can take you from Limehouse right round to Brentford. Who needs a Norfolk Broads when you can find aquatic bliss in NW1 or even East 3? Once upon a time, of course, the Thames was a pretty busy stretch of water and its warehouses rang to the cries of underpaid dockers rather than those of Jeremy and Pippa and the other gentrifiers. Nowadays, what traffic is left on the old river is mostly pleasure craft, though some people's idea of pleasure isn't exactly mine. But you can also spot a new breed of boat people on the river, people like Mike and Ali. Two years ago, they put an end to their flat hunting problems when they first clapped eyes on their trusty barge, Reliance. Since then, it's been a non-stop labour of love to convert it. Constant sawing, plumbing, wiring and welding have transformed this shell into a two-bedroom floating flat. This may all sound pretty idyllic, but it's not all plain sailing. At times, the going can get a bit rough. I suppose the lowest of the low comes on a, a cold winter's morning when there's ice on the decks. And it's Monday morning and the, the El San is full. You know what an El San is. I do you indeed. Expect? I lived in a caravan once myself. It's a chemical to toilet. That's right. The El San is full. And the water's run out and it's frozen up anyway and uh, you've got to go out on the deck with your gas torch and unfreeze the water and then you've got to carry the Elsan up the ladder and, and so at times like ladder. that you think um, why don't I live in a nice cosy little centrally heated house where all the systems are automatic but uh, those times are, are quite rare. Well, they'd, uh, I must say they live in my memory having to unfreeze my own lavatory before I could empty it. I mean what are the uh, I reckon you'd have to have some pretty impressive good times to offset that. What are the good times? What's good about it? I don't think it's that you have specifically, you know, good times all the time. It's that it's a quality of life. Um, I mean, look, it's beautiful, isn't it? Do you know what? We might see Laura and Helen on their boat when we go past. Mike and Ali's boat is moored at Chiswick, in tidal waters. Fine when the tide's in, but when it goes out and leaves you high and dry on the sloping riverbed, life can get rather complicated. Well, we'll never at the moment, but when the tide goes out, we, uh, we sit on the bottom at a, a five degree angle, which can, can cause some problems. I mean, it's best to have a bath when the tide's in. We tend to organise our baths when the tide's in, because otherwise you end up with two inches at your bottom end and a foot at the tap end. <laughs> um, and cooking. It's good to cook eggs when the tide's out, because uh, then you get all the fat down oh and yes, one yes. side of the Spoon pan. It all in. But, uh, I came badly unstuck when I was cooking uh, Lisa's birthday cake. I don't know if you cook cakes, and I cooked it while the tide was out. It's a wedge-shaped cake. I had about one inch on one side, about four inches on the other. 
Mind you, even with a fried egg, I mean, surely it'd be easier to move the pan than move the house. Most people would have thought, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> fair enough. Living on the water for pleasure is a relatively recent thing. Houseboats, like babies, came along in a big post-war boom. Lovely, isn't it? And, believe it or not, it's only 30 minutes from the heart of London. A woodland haven of painted boats, little ships which once sailed for Dunkirk, larger craft which have sailed the Atlantic. Many families came to Cubitt's Yacht Basin when housing shortage drove them to seek homes afloat. Others saw it at a place where their children would be safe from the noise and dust of city streets. It's a floating village of man-built hulls, where the homemaking touch of women folk and the laughter of kiddies have brought neighborliness and peace. The present generation of boaters also go overboard for love and peace and neighborliness. But Mike and Ali are a bit unusual, because their houseboat is, well, it's a boat. When they want to pop over and visit friends in Twickenham, they simply unplug the mains electricity, phone ahead and chug up river. Not many people can do that, because although many of these craft may look like boats, most of them have had their engines ripped out and have well and truly dropped anchor. Now this stick in the mud attitude is well out of order to most canal lovers. Canal people are a completely different species altogether. Not for them the passive life of bobbing up and down with the tide. Water, in their view, is there to be travelled on. What's the, uh, what's the magic of travelling on a boat for you? Mm, I think probably the speed's got a lot to do with it. That you're hardly going anywhere. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I just like canals. They're either in the country, which is nice, or they're in places like this, which I find interesting, for the remains of railway lines and docks and factories and things. Giles, uh, I mean, all this, I know this part of London quite well, but it looks, all looks very strange to me from this perspective. Where are we at the moment? Well, we just passed it behind the back of St Pancras. You can sort of see the spires over there and uh, the gas holders, which perhaps you don't normally notice. And we just passed under the railway line, which is the main line up from St Pancras. Before that was the main line up from Euston, which you, again, you probably haven't seen the canal from the railway, I shouldn't think. So, in fact, you do get quite a, quite a different look at the traditional landmarks, don't you? Yes, you see it all from underneath, really, the, sort of the back side of everything, I think. That's the thing about life on the water. You see London from a completely different perspective. For lawyers Giles and Jennet, the biggest thrill of this kind of life is to dawdle along the backside of London, gazing adoringly at rusty old derricks. You see, they're industrial archaeology freaks, very much into the relics of a bygone era. Mind you, all this would have seemed very odd to the people who actually made their living on the water. Your working boat people would have found anyone who stopped to admire railway lines or factories deeply mad. For them, time was money. The faster they got from A to B, the more money they would earn. Well, I'll give an example of from Guinness's Brewery. They used to start loading at 8 o'clock in the morning, finish loading by about 10, 10.30, then they would be underway. They would travel the whole of the remainder of that day, um, change over during the evening so that the skipper and perhaps his wife would sleep while the children would work the boats and then carry on until they got to Birmingham which was a run of 52 hours. London to Birmingham wasn't the only canal route. You could have travelled right round England as long as you weren't in a hurry. Ron Andrews worked on the canals in a hurry for over 40 years and as a toll clerk at Little Venice monitored canal traffic when the waterways were as busy as the M1 is today. Early shift, start at five. First tug out with uh, rubbish barges, quarter to six. Half past six, second tug. Maribyrn Borough Council going to North Holt. Uh, six or seven boats. Quarter past seven, Thomas Clayton going out to Yedding. Their own tip, seven or eight boats. By the time you'd had your breakfast, you've got your tugs coming in from the other end, West Drayton, Stockley, Cowley, uh, Sand, Ballast, Shingle, into Paddington Basin. You've got the same procedure to do then, gauge them, work out the weights and the tolls. Most of the space on working boats was given up for cargo. The family lived in the back cabin, eight feet by six feet. Quite a problem if you had 15 children, as many of them did. 
As soon as possible, the kids were put to work on their own pair of boats or farmed out to uncles, aunts and cousins round the canal network. At the Hambridges, they were one of the biggest families. I think she had 17 children all together. And um, they used to come in for their orders. I would go down the lay-by, give them their orders. And uh, you'd walk along the lay-by and you would uh, look into the cabins and you'd see all the kids' heads uh, lined up from one end of the cabin to the other. And Mary Hambridge would be getting their meals ready. Uh, but they were good kids. The building of the M1 25 years ago put the final nail in the coffin of the canals as a means of transport and a way of life. You don't find anyone from the old boating families living on canals anymore. They couldn't wait to swap the romance of the water for a fitted kitchen and a flushing loo. Nowadays, the canal user is a very different type. There's been a kind of middle-class takeover by what you might call the uh, floating SDP voter, the kind of person who wants an alternative lifestyle. Mind you, this lot work pretty hard too on their boats. Swabbing decks, emptying the rubbish, not to mention the latrines. When your water hose is just too short. When galley duties give you a headache. When your prized possessions become so much flotsam and jetsam. Well, it's a hard life keeping everything shipshape. And this is what happens if you don't. We went down to Camden Lock and we had to turn round to get back to our mooring. And being our first trip, we didn't really know what we were doing. It was the Sunday market, there were thousands of people, it was incredibly windy. And we just got totally stuck sideways for about probably half an hour. We broke a pole trying to turn round. We attracted thousands of people who were just standing around watching us and no, laughing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just so embarrassing. Yes. Claire and Pete's boat is moored at Battlebridge Basin, just behind King's Cross. Like many other boat dwellers, they almost seem to enjoy roughing it. No fiberglass gin palaces here. We thought it was going to be a major disaster at first when we actually moved on and we couldn't light the fire and there was no electricity and it was horrid. Mm. But we persevered and we're in love with it now. We wouldn't change it for anything. And to top it all, life afloat is anything but cheap. Pete and Claire spend 3,000 a year on basic maintenance. And with one plank of oak costing 800 quid, that's if you can find a tall enough tree, you can easily spend money like water. Not even the arrival of their baby has made Pete and Claire hanker for dry land. They do own a house, but they wouldn't dream of living in it. We, we've since bought a house, but we don't really live in it. Um, we bought it for, for a number of reasons. Uh, convenience of uh, mains electricity and uh, having, having a, an address is, is one of the main things. And a bath. And a bath, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so you don't live in it, you just pop back for a... That's right, yes, yes, yeah. It just stands there. We, we, we would much prefer to live in the, in the boat. Much nicer. Well, they've obviously been bitten by the canal bug, but nowhere near as much as their neighbour, Mary Gibby. I first bought a boat in 1974, so I've been living on a boat for more than ten years. Uh, I like living on a narrow boat, and mm. I also like a narrow boat that's traditional, and it's traditional to have a boat with a small cabin, like this. Was this boat like this when you bought it? No, in fact, um, when I bought it, it had a conversion on it. The, the hold was converted. You mean it, there was actually living space over the... That's right, but, yes. You had a lot of space, in fact, when you bought this? Yes, uh, well, that I could have lived in, yes. Uh, and you took it off? I took it off. You I wanted a tr traditional boat. <laughs> you actually deliberately <laughs> reduced yourself to the level of when these were working boats? That's right. It's a bit like knocking down your three-bedroom semi and living in the wardrobe. Remember, the back cabin is only eight foot by six foot, and Mary doesn't live alone. She shares it with her boyfriend. Well, you cook on the, um, the range mm -hmm. um, using coal, so you have to plan ahead and everything takes quite a long time. And you wash in a hand bowl that hangs up by the range. And uh, Where does the, the water come from? Well, you collect it from the nearest tap in cans. Um, that you keep on the roof by the chimney. Where do you sleep? Um, the bed folds, folds down. 
get rid of the seat. So you have to take the take the that seat. seat off. Yes. Yeah. And fold it down. Oh, and you sleep and fold it down sideways. And you sleep across the boat, and the mattress rolls out. How splendid! That's very cosy. There's no question. And uh, is that a more more storage space through that door at the end there? Or what? Just a minute. <laughs> oh dear, here's a little. Sorry. I'm Mind you, it's pretty easy to make the bed, isn't it? That's true. You can just hide it all away. Yeah, fold it up, throw it away. So, is that have you got more storage space through there, or what? No, that's the engine room. That's it. That's the engine next door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hang up my best suit in there. With space so cramped, you'd expect every available hook to hold teacups, car keys, maybe even a screwdriver or two, but not with Mary. It's traditional to hang plates up in boats, that's why. And um, most people who live on this type of boat collect plates. And I've just got as wide a selection as I've been able to find. Now you may think Mary's a little extreme, even for a canal freak. But she simply realised what is every narrow boat owner's secret fantasy. I think for most people who live on narrow boats, um, deconverting your boat and living in a back cabin is, uh, is their dream. It's, uh, it's not necessarily very practical for, for a lot of people, but uh, it's, I think it's, it's, it's all, it's, every one of us is our dream to do it. So despite the awful lack of space, secretly you envy her for having done it? I think so, yes. But in the quest for cramped, uncomfortable living conditions, there's one fellow who beats the canalers hollow. Ian McCulloch built this raft two years ago, and since then he's lived happily in the middle of the Thames by Battersea Bridge. Apparently, he likes to get away from it all. So do the residents of the Chelsea houseboats, who live just across the river. But they do it in a rather different style. The houseboat community here has always had a somewhat bohemian reputation. Dorothy Tootin and Quentin Crisp are just two of the famous names who've lived here over the years. William Meredith Owen reckons he's a bit of a free spirit himself. So when he had to move to London, he fancied living here, amongst the actors, photographers and designers who still float in Chelsea's boats. It's very unclaustrophobic for living in the middle of London. And I particularly like this boat, which has a certain style, and which I could just afford then. And to get anything of the same sort of character and feel of being a bit special would have cost uh, just a fortune on land. So it suited me very well because of that. This is an Oxford College barge. And um, from about 1850 onwards, when rowing became a for a sport amongst with the Oxford colleges. Uh, they had the problem of where to keep their boats and also they needed somewhere for people to watch the races from and so on. I hate the water, uh, as a rule. I'm not a, not a, not a seagoing person at all. No, it's just because of the, the, the style and the, and the history of this particular boat. Like many other Chelsea boat owners, William's not what you might call a sea dog. In fact, his biggest worry was that he would spend most of his time throwing up over the side. And that was my big anxiety before moving in. Um, and in fact, before I sort of actually bought the boat, I went and knocked on people's doors and asked them if this was a great problem in their life. And they all looked at me as if I was mad. And of course it isn't, because after a day or two or a week or two, you just get oblivious, really. I can't even tell when the boat's up or down now. Get so used to it. There is a river the river of no I can't imagine how I ever lived without being on a boat. It's wonderful. And sometimes wild and free. Love is a dream. Chelsea dwellers are given to exotic behaviour. They appreciate the finer things in life, and above all, they love their river. As you can see, actress Jackie and Joel, a hair cutter, have a whale of a time on their houseboat. Living afloat keeps them close to each other and to nature. Oh. That's what, for me, has been the best thing about it, because it is very elemental. And living in London, you do get cut off from that, and you get cut off from the most vital thing in yourself, which is yourself. And living with the river, I know whatever happens, that twice a day that river will come in, and she will go out. And it makes me aware that there is something far bigger than us, and that is nature. And it gives me such hope. On the river and 
forever my heart will you Suddenly you hear her splashing against the side. And we always, always get very excited. We look at each other and say, she's in. And then she comes in and we lift off. And depending on her mood, if she's uh, rough, we love it best when she's rough. Well, Jackie may like a bit of rough, but what everyone at Chelsea simply adores is the village atmosphere. I went next door to Betty one day. We got no water. We had no water for four days. The boat was like a tip, washing up everywhere. The only thing I could find to drink was vodka, so I did. And I needed some water, and I went next door to Betty. She got one saucepan left, and she gave me the other half. And that's wonderful. Yes, it, add, it actually adds oh, to it, the, it the fact that the pictures fall off the walls and, uh, I mean, little mishaps always happen. It That's when the tide's the, in. Yes, yes the tides. all that is just makes life very exciting. And being waking up by the Dutch in the morning, that's one of the wonderful things. Yes. I find it all so beautiful, you see. I probably just die of the beauty of it all. That's all right, what a way to go. While some people fill their boats with champagne, others fill them with coal. Simply living on a narrow boat wasn't enough for John and Sue Yates. They decided to work on the water too, delivering coal along the canal. It's dirty, it's hard, and by God, they love every minute of it. Well, we've been doing it for three years now. We, um, we started off, as so many people did, well, I started off simply having holidays on the canal, then lived on a boat on it, and while doing that, so I saw that the canal is no longer used for cargo carrying, because it's built for cargo carrying, the world's first industrial transport system, and um, it seemed a good idea to try and see if we could make sense of carrying again. There seems to be no limit to the lengths people will go to to recreate the past. Uh, we load it loose, we, we bring it down, about 40 tonnes of it, and sell it as we go down. We bag it up into 25 kilogram bags. Coal is all metric now. And um, we aren't really doing it because we want to be coal men. We're doing it because we want to run cargo carrying narrowboats on the canal. And we, and we hope that several other people will, like us, find that, uh, that it can be made economic. Well, I'm not too sure the idea will catch on. It seems to me Bob a Job Week's a better bet for earning your fortune. And John must have a sneaking suspicion I'm right, because he's kept on his ordinary job in the historic building section of the GLC. And when he goes off for a nice day in his centrally heated office, Sue is left to carry the coal. The worst part is sometimes when you're travelling loaded um, on the long sections where you may be travelling for as long as three hours without a lock. Um, and you've got to keep a fire going, look after a small child and do the cooking at the same time as steering a boat which the minute you leave the tiller sort of tries to bury itself in the nearest field. It's, that's, that's the hardest part. I don't, I don't mind the, the coaling so much. I mean, it's a bit like knitting, you sort of mind switches off and you think of something else whilst you're doing it. I suppose it's a romantic attraction in a way. It's also, in a sense, a conservation exercise because we're um, showing how, the, how the, the canal can still be used. For, for transport by water. Whereas the passion of the canal enthusiasts is fired by nostalgia, Jerry Braben believes in going full steam ahead into the future. Tags Island near Hampton Court in West London was derelict when Jerry moved there, but he had a vision of what life on the water should be about. One and a half million pounds later, he's created an idyllic haven for those who like their dreams to come packaged with all mod cons. I have had it, um, or heard it said, that uh, we tend to be the plastic people because we tend to want to live afloat in what I call modern comfort with all mod cons, um, as opposed to grubbing it along perhaps with emptying our sands and heaving lines fore and aft every time we want to move the vessel. And when Jerry says mod cons, he certainly means it. This may not look like a houseboat, but it's the Braben's floating home. And he's now got some more ideas for that boat. He thinks he's going to have a jacuzzi in both bathrooms, would you believe? If you're thinking of moving onto a boat, but are frightened of taking the plunge, Jerry and Gillian can help. They'll lease you a mooring and design your boat, complete with a free dinghy, in case you should ever fancy exploring what you're living on. We're just not prepared to, 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 to accept a lower, uh, lesser standard of living afloat than we would be ashore. 
Um, you've seen my vessel. We've got um, split level bedrooms, gold plated bathrooms, sunken bath, um, uh, television in every room, video recorders. We've got um, scalding hot water, main sewage. We've got every modern facility that you could wish for to have uh, fitted kitchens and fitted bathrooms, microwave cooking, um, tumble dryers, dishwashers, refrigerators, split level cookers, hobs. Um, it's just as if you were buying a, an upmarket house uh, anywhere in the country. Here we're definitely in suburbia on sea. Only the water lapping round your sandals lets you know you're not actually in rice lip. All this comfort may seem sacrilege to keen boating folk, but Jerry's had no shortage of customers eager to discover their sea legs. We have quite a lot of families on the island who've come in the last um, 12, 15 months, 18 months, who've sold substantially large houses in um, other areas uh, to come to this place specifically to live afloat. It's attracted them, and uh, the phrase we generally hear the most is, I've always wanted to live afloat, but didn't know how to go about it or wasn't prepared to live in a sinking barge uh, but with these sort of houseboats of course that doesn't matter. It was an article in the Observer that we just saw one Sunday in February two years ago and my husband threw it over and I think it said floating an idea or something like that and he said how about that and it had always been a vague notion to live on a houseboat except I thought they were really like caravans and obviously they're not and I just it was just a germ that grew in my head and we came down to see the island and and that was it since moving to Tags Island Judy and her family have never been happier it's funny water seems to have that kind of effect on people come on come on come on come on come on Shell-shocked victims of city life are miraculously reborn as children of nature. And another thing, they start coming over all sort of lyrical. It's just a magical way of life. It's so near London, but we come across the bridge and it's a magic island. The whole atmosphere changes. It's beautiful. It's, it's just calm and you forget everything as soon as you come on the bridge. You see the water and it's a different kind of life. Well, one thing's for certain. Everybody who lives on the water in London just loves it. There are some people whose idea of boating is sipping a gin and tonic and watching the world slip by. Others who like to thrash up and down the canals in their one tiny little cabin. And then there's those old-fashioned souls who just can't resist the romance of life afloat. Of course, on a frosty morning when the chemical loo's full and the water tank's empty, it can all get a bit tough. But everybody seems to agree when you wake up the sound of water gently lapping and there's ducks floating past your living room window and you're rocked to sleep at night by the gentle ebb and flow of the tide. Well, there's only one way to sum it up, eh? Sheer poetry. Glide gently, thus forever glide, O Thames, that other bards may see as lovely visions by thy side as now. Fair river, come to me. Oh, glide, fair stream, forever so. Thy quiet soul on all bestowing, till all our minds forever flow as thy deep waters now are flowing. Now let us, as we float along, for him suspend the dashing oar, and pray that never child of song may know that poet sorrows more. How calm. How still, the only sound, the dripping of the oar suspended. The evening darkness gathers round, by virtue's holiest powers attended. Oh. If you'd like to know where to go to see those much-loved boats and barges, then you can consult Oracle on page 364.